uh, uh, verses I'd like to read in preparation to our text. As you can see from the bulletin, the text is going to be Psalm 94, verse 9. Um, before that, I'm going to read a few verses from Psalm 139 and verse 1 through 6. Uh, if you'd like to follow along, you need not to, but in Psalm 139, the first six verses, let me read that just as background. Psalm 139, verse 1, to the chief musician, a psalm of David. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Those verses, of course, speaking about the omniscience and omnipresence of God. God is everywhere present. God knows all things. The second verse I'd like to read, just by way of background, is Proverbs 20 and verse 12. The 20th chapter of Proverbs and verse 12 with this declaration of fact. The hearing ear and the seeing eye the Lord hath made even both of them. And then our text for the message this morning, Psalm 94 and verse 9. He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? What and how God hears. If you look at the bulletin, it looks like a heavy lift. There's a lot of points and subpoints, but this is going to be kind of like a survey. Um, so don't get a, don't get scared from the outline. Um, the first couple of points we're going to go through quite quickly. But first of all, let me talk by way of introduction. Uh, this message is a little bit of a follow-on to the message from February. Uh, God knows all things. We talked during that message about the omniscience of God, and I was thinking about a theme in the Bible that is connected um, to that idea and that illustrates it for us so that we can understand it in a, in a very practical way. When we think about the omniscience of God, the tendency is to think, since God knows all things perfectly, completely, instantly, that God is in the heaven with, with this knowledge, all-encompassing knowledge, and we are so far removed, we're an infinity of infinities away from God, that that doctrine is not personal. But in fact, David said in Psalm 139, it's very personal. It's a, it's a, we have a personal God, and these doctrines have personal involvement in our life. And so today I just want to expand our theological thinking just a little bit to try to begin to understand a little bit more how God works and why God in his word inscripturates certain truths in, in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And I want this, doc this doctrine of the omniscience of God to, to be close to us, even as God is close. Do you remember... Remember what Paul said on, on, in Athens on Mars Hill. He said, God is not very far away from every one of us. And he was talking not just to the believers. He was talking to the poets um, and, and the Stoics and those who uh, just wanted to hear a new thing all the time. Uh, like da David knew God was, was very close. So that's what we'd like to go through today. And the main takeaway is learn a little bit more about the omniscience of God, understand it is close, and to expand our thinking a little bit to see this theme of one way that God develops this. 
So secondly, two definitions quickly. Anthropomorphism and the omniscience of God. Anthropomorphism. So the scripture says that God hears things. But we also know God is a spirit. And so God does not have ears. It also says he sees things. We would say he doesn't have eyes the way we do. And the scripture uses human analogies, this anthropomorphism, so that we can try to understand God in human terms. God, God is condescending to us to give us these imageries and these pictures. God is a spirit, but the scripture sometimes speaks of him in human terms so we can understand. Anthro, man, morph, form. God has the form of a man in scripture just to illustrate certain things about God. And so you'll read God hears things or God sees things or God's hand moved to do something. Again, imagery to help us to understand. Psalm 94 and verse nine, he that planted the ear, shall he not hear? The ear is a very remarkable piece of creation. I've heard or read that the little tiny bones in your ear that help you hear, when you were born as an infant, those little bones were fully matured. Today they are the same size as when you came out of the birth canal. And, and the whole idea of God's spoken word and for us to receive God's word both audibly or visually and in our heart is a miracle in and of itself that we could spend an eternity to understand. And obviously if God formed the ear, he can hear. So again, anthropomorphism, we're going to talk about God hearing things and that's the context of how we say that. Second definition quick quickly, the omniscience of God. We spoke about this last month. It simply means God knows all things. In Psalm 139, David said, you understand my thoughts afar off. God understands my thoughts that I'm not going to have for another year or two. He's acquainted with all of my ways. There's not a word in my tongue, but lo, that's a word like behold, Take notice, remember when Jesus would say, verily, verily? Well, he's the son of man. He doesn't have to say, now I'm saying this truthfully. But he would sometimes say, truly, truly, to emphasize. And David is emphasizing this. Behold, Lord, you know it all together. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. The light and the darkness are both alike unto him. We saw that the nature of God's knowledge is innate. It's part of his character. We learn things by experience, observation, study, all of these things that we put together. God knows all things comprehensively, inclusively, completely in an instant. He, he knows all things. So what I want to do at this point now is to move into this just very brief survey of looking at some passages where it says God hears something. And I want us to think of this in terms of the omniscience of God, of what he hears. And I'd like to begin, so we're on point three, if you're following the outline already, we're already at point three. I want to introduce this, this concept with you um, that you know, God hears and he, how, how it is that he hears. And I want, want to introduce it by, by giving you a personal illustration. And I think you'll see what I'm getting at. So when I was in the military, my, my MOS, my military occupational specialty, my job, was I was a non-communications intercept analyst. 
And what that would mean would be I would intercept non-communications. What is that? I would intercept that, and then I would try to analyze it and, and understand it. We normally think of communication as talking. Mm. And we use words and phrases. We can also communicate with pictures and, and the written word. But when someone talks to you and they, they, they have inflection and words, that's communication. My job was to listen to non-communications and figure out what that means. So for example, I would gather and listen to telemetry, satellite signals, radar signals. And there was a lot of information you could get out of that. The first day I went to this, this military school to learn this, they had us put on headphones and listen to this library of sounds. And I put these headphones on, and what I heard was static, chimes, intermittent beeps and squeaks, something that sounded like bagpipes, uh, something that sounded like the old-fashioned dial-up internet sounds. All, all of this RF, radio frequency, electronic signals that you can't hear with the human ear but if you have equipment that is listening in that spectrum, it can hear that. And when you hear that noise, it might sound like static. It might sound like beeping. It might sound like a, a weird electronic noise, but it has intelligence in it. I could listen to a certain sound and I could tell you that's a radar system associated with a certain weapon system. And I could tell you if that sound meant they were gonna send a missile, or they were just turning on the equipment to run a diagnostic to see if it was working, or a host of other things. All of these signals, you look out the window, and you can't see this, but there's all these signals flying all over the place. And they all have meaning. They're all descriptive if you know how to listen for them and if you know how to hear them and, and what they mean. Relative to the omniscience of God, God hears things that you might think are inanimate, inaudible, single instances, thoughts, the scripture says, and I don't have time to show you all the places where it says, God hears that thing. And so I want to just, like I said, briefly survey these type of things that God hears to open up our, our thinking, our theological thinking about the omniscience of God, which is very close to us. It's a personal doctrine and, and what it is and why God says he hears this particular thing. So on item three on your outline, I say that God hears with indignation and judgment three things. First of all, the voice of sin. Genesis 4 and verse 10, Jehovah said, what is this that thou hast done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. God is said to, to hear the voice of blood that was shed. The voice of blood that's crying from the ground, shed in an act of sinful rage. Innocent blood, innocent in the sense it did not deserve to die because of someone else's sin and rage and wickedness. You know the story of Genesis 4. Adam and Eve began to procreate once they were expelled from the garden. They had two sons initially, Abel, a keeper of the sheep, Cain, a tiller of the ground. And the season of worship came, and Abel brought the firstling of his, of his flock and the fat. And with that, God was very well pleased. Yeah. But unto Cain, the scripture says, 
who brought of the fruit of the ground, his labor, his works, God did not have respect. Cain gets angry, his countenance falls, and when he had opportunity, he murdered his brother. And he attempted to hide it from the Lord. I guess he was going to try to hide it from Adam and Eve. I don't know how that would have worked out. But he attempts to hide it from the Lord, and he dismisses the Lord. Remember, God said, where is, said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And, and, and Cain tries to dismiss the Lord. Am I my brother's keeper? And again, verse 10, God says, what is this that thou hast done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. God hears this voice. Now, is this figurative language only? I, I tend to believe it's, it's figurative language, except that the scripture has so many things that, that have a voice. Or is every single one of them figurative? Or are we so limited in our, in our humanness that we cannot hear what God hears or hear the way God hears? But even if it's figurative language, it's, it's very striking, is it not? It's very startling to have this imagery of, of blood crying from the ground for vengeance. Verse 10 and 11. So it's really signifying the, the awfulness of this sin. If, if, if blood has a voice that's crying out, I don't want to hear that. It, it would be the worst horror movie that you would ever hear. Because this is reality and this is truth. Does, does the blood keep crying until vengeance is realized? Did, I mean, is, is, is Abel's blood crying today before God's throne because it has yet to be in the final judgment? The, the, this whole thing completed as far as the pronouncement by God? What does the sound of the voice of the blood of 65.5 million aborted babies in the United States. What does that sound like before God's throne? What is the sound in God's hearing of, of all of the cumulative sound of all the blood that has been shed in a way, as I said, as Abel was shed, innocent in the sense that of that particular issue, it should not have been shed. In, in, in Genesis 4, this, this word bloods, it's actually plural, a signifying that it's, it's not just that someone was killed or lost their life, but it was, it was murder. And it was a violation of God's moral order. God's established a, a law that the shedding of blood is just the greatest violation of who God is and what he has set out as the created order. And it is crying out for vengeance. In a figurative way, the voice, every sin in scripture has a voice. And it, it, we have this expressed connection be, between sin and his punishment for every peculiar sin, every singular sin, every different sin. And it's a voice of crime that cries against the sinner and cries out to God. And God has this indignation and, and this judgment. And it does not go unnoticed. 1 Timothy 5 verse 24 says, Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before them to judgment. Some men's sins follow after. In other words, not every day is instant judgment day for an individual. But that doesn't mean God has forgotten. That doesn't mean God has no longer hears what the voice of that is saying. Again, is this figurative language? I tend to believe that it's figurative, but it's very striking. And we also know that Christ's blood has a voice as well. 
I was thinking about Hebrews 12, verse 24, that the, bud, the blood of sprinkling, the scripture says, speaketh better things than that of Abel's. It preaches, is the word. It talks. It tells. And if the blood of Christ has a real voice that the Holy Spirit uses to, to save the sinner, um, um, that voice, too, would, would be uh, under, under God's economy, under God's blessing. It would be very powerful, obviously, because it takes someone from death to life. Does it have an audible in God's frequency and spectrum of hearing things? Does it have a voice? Like with Lazarus, uh, uh, when uh, Ezekiel audibly prophesied to dead bones, yet they heard. Or when Jesus spoke to Lazarus, who was dead in the tomb, Jesus audibly saying, come forth, and Lazarus came forth. It's, it's just interesting to me this, this, this voice of this blood crying and, and implications and applications of that. God hears the voice of the blood of Abel, of shed blood. Secondly, God hears the voice of wickedness. I'm not sure we can differentiate between certain sins and certain situations, but the Bible does attach God's hearing to some of these situations and some of these issues. And here I'm thinking about the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah that went up before the throne of grace. In Genesis 18 and verse 20, the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is grievous, I will go down now and see whether or not they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come up to me. And I've, if not, I will know it. So here the imagery is God hears this cry of wickedness, and it's almost as though God says, wait a minute, this, this is unbelievable. It can't be this bad. I, I have to go down to verify it. Certainly they have not sinned against nature. Certainly they have not sinned against the created. It can't be that widespread. What is this, that their sin is so bad, it cries to God with this self-condemnation in it almost that it has to be judged immediately. Our Lord, when he cast out the demon, uh, multiple demons from that individual who was throwing himself into the fire, you remember what those demons said? They said, send us into the swine. And then the swine, he did, and then the swine ran violently down a steep cliff into the ocean and drowned. It's almost like that. The sin is so bad, it's telling God, you know, put us out of our misery, you know, kill the sin. God says the cry has come up before God. This word means to cry out because of pain, because of sorrow. There is a physical response to this sin. In Genesis 19, where those three angels, God, I think, appearing, um, they tell Ad, uh, Abraham, the cry has waxen great before the Lord. It's an outcry of distress. It's waxen great. It's become magnified. It's become large. And God is hearing this constantly. And God says, I must do something. In the same way that the voice of shed blood must be a terrible voice to hear if it was real, so too the voice of wickedness before God's, God is thrice holy. God is separate from sinners. And yet he's omniscient and he hears the voice of, of wickedness. He heard, the, he heard the voice of Sodom and Gomorrah. So as you know, his indignation and his judgment is manifest as he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Fire and brimstone rained down from heaven and he overthrew all the cities of the plain, all the inhabitants of the city, and everything that grew upon the ground. God says, I want to stop hearing that. And the only way he could stop 
hearing that was to destroy it. That's our God. Thirdly, God hears the voice of idolatry. The scripture says idolatry makes a sound before God, and God hears the voice of idolatry. And God is a jealous God. This too must be an awful, terrible voice, whatever sound it makes. Worship of false gods and false worship of the true God, both are false. In Psalm 78, God recounts the tremendous separation that he worked between Egypt and his own people. And God said he guided his people in the wilderness. He said he led them on safely. He said the Red Sea destroyed, overwhelmed their enemies. He brought them to the border of his sanctuary, his land. He cast out the heathen before them so they could come in and take possession of everything. And yet, the scripture says in verse 56 of Psalm 78, they tempted and they provoked the Most High God and did not keep his word. They turned back, they dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They turned aside like a deceitful bow. They provoked him to anger with their high places, and they moved him to jealousy with their graven images. And when God heard this, when God heard their idolatry, he was wrath, he was wroth, and he greatly abhorred Israel. God either heard directly this idolatrous sounds of false worship, or maybe he heard a report from one of his angels. I don't know, but this sound provoked him to jealousy. This sound of so unspiritual, uh, probably the same type of sound when, when Israel worshiped the golden calf. Music, dancing, playing, uh, saying, these are your gods, O Israel, that brought you out of Egypt, this, Thing that they made of their own hands, this, this jarring noise. Scripture says when God heard this, God heard this sound of idolatry, and he greatly abhorred Israel. Paul said, what concord does God have with Belial? What concord or fellowship does the believer have with unrighteousness or with with, with, a, with, a, with a Satan worshiper. What is, why, why do we have to get involved with false worship, with idolatry, with mixing in things that God never asked us to mix in in the worship of him? If I, if I say the word to you, symphonic, you would think of a symphony with all these instruments that blend together, that make one voice of a song that is melodious, that is beautiful, that is, is so orchestrated that it has you know, all the movements and, and everything is just right. It's pleasant to the ear. It's something that you want to hear. But if I say the word cacophony or discordant, you get the imagery of musical instruments. None of them are in tune. They're not playing the same tune. It's, it's like a clanging cymbal. You want it to stop. I think that's what the, the sound of idolatry sounds. It is so out of place in God's holy tabernacle in heaven. The sound of idolatry. God has to abhor Israel. And he says, this is an amazing verse, verse 60. He forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he had placed among men. That's, God had this place in Shiloh. The tabernacle was there. His presence was there. And he had to forsake it. He had to leave. He's a jealous God. God, God hears these types of things. These, everything has a voice. 
and God hears it all. God hears sin, he hears wickedness, he hears idolatry. Fourthly, God hears with perception. And here we have too the voice of murmuring and complaining and the voice of doubt. The voice of murmuring. So how often have you read in scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, recounting what happened in the Exodus, where throughout the whole 40 years, and then once even they got into the promised land, the murmuring, the complaining to God about God's ways and God's plan. A typical ex example in Exodus 16, verse 12, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. God repeatedly heard their lack of trust in him, their selfishness where they wanted to do their own thing, they had a better way to run their life. They murmured. They murmured and complained about manna. They murmured and complained about the way God would take them. They murmured about uh, God had raised up Moses. Moses once was not someone who was saying, I'm your leader, I'm your commander, listen to me. Moses was the most humble man upon the earth. He didn't necessarily want to be there. But God said, you're the man. And so they complained against the man. They murmured. They complained. When you trace through the murmuring and the complaining, God, again, has to put a stop to it several times. Remember the account of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, who were murmuring and complaining, and God had to open up the ground beneath them and swallow them up so that noise would stop. <coughs> Numbers 21, which you looked at a couple years ago, where they were murmuring and complaining. And so God sent snakes among them to bite them and kill them. This is our God. Others did not get to enter into the promised land because they were murmuring and complaining and did not believe God was going to do what God said. Philippians 2 says, do everything, everything means everything, without murmuring and disputing so that you might be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. The rest of the world out there, I can tell you right now, is murmuring and complaining. Murmuring about the economy. Murmuring about this, that, and everything else. God wants a people that are content in Christ. Come what may. God hears. I heard their murmurings. He says it constantly. God hears the voice of doubt. God hears the voice of doubt when it is verbal. There's an account where Elisha, the Old Testament prophet, had prophesied to the king of a dramatic end to a very grievous famine. And the king's right-hand man said, God can't do it. Even if God were to open the windows of heaven, it's not going to happen. He doubted God. And God, through Elisha, told him, it's going to happen, and you're not going to see it. And he was killed. As God opened up the windows of heaven, and people rushed to get the food, and they, they trampled him to death, basically. But the, one, the case I'm thinking about is Sarah, when she doubted God. And God, it says, heard something that she didn't say. In Genesis chapter 18, when these three angels are on their way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but before that happens, they are recounting to Abraham that him and Sarah would have a son through which the seed of promise would eventually come. And they are reiterating the covenant promise of God to Abraham. While they're talking to Abraham outside, Sarah is in the tent. And the scripture says in verse 11, now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, so that it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. So Sarah hears this in verse 12, therefore Sarah laughed within herself saying, after I am waxen old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord also being old? 
And the Lord said unto Abraham, Jehovah said unto Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? He heard her laugh. Why did she say, of a surety, will I bear a child which am old? And then, of course, Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh because she was afraid. And what did God say? Nay, but thou didst laugh. She laughed within herself, perhaps because there was just this, this long delay between the, the initial time the promise was given and the fulfillment of it. Maybe she, it was, this weakened her faith. She thought that this announcement, this reiteration was just, just too incredible to believe. And then when she was confronted, she aggravated her, her distrust by, by trying to cover it up. We know that covering a sin never works. She was focusing on natural resources, her natural abil ability and not the word of God. Abraham, we know, was fully persuaded and, and was able that, to know that what he had promised, he was able also to perform, but Sarah was weak in faith. And her unbelief, there's a lot of things going on with her. Her unbelief was offensive to God. Um, he has to tell her, is anything too hard for the Lord? Nothing is secret that can escape his awareness. Why did, why did you laugh? Sarah is found out. She is still going to be the, the vehicle, the, 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 the lady to whom this seed will come. But she's put up this roadblock where God has to deal with it. No, you did laugh. Scripture says, he that covers his sin will not prosper. But on a larger scale, the scripture says, there was nothing covered that shall not be revealed. There was nothing hid that shall not be made known. Sarah's laugh is recorded in scripture. She laughed within herself. God heard it and God recorded it. He hears everything. He's not very far from every one of us. He knows our thoughts are far off. She should have said, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Then it would have been well. It would have been okay. It would have been good. But it's another thing to laugh at the promises of God and then try to cover it up. Fifthly, God hears with compassion. He hears the voice of dejection. He hears the voice of sadness. The voice of dejection, let me just mention that God says several times in the book of Acts, the, the book of Acts, the book of Exodus, when he heard the voice of his people groaning under the slave, their slavery to Egypt. Not only did they cry out to God with prayers, which they did, but the scripture says that just under the, the taskmasters, they would groan. They would have sorrow. They would express anguish one to another by reason of their taskmasters, verse 7 of Exodus 3. They would groan as they went about this work, not directing it to anybody, but God hears their groaning as they're trying to fulfill what, what the taskmasters of Egypt were, were having them to do. And God in Acts chapter 7, verse 34 said, I have heard their groaning. There's this dejection or this despair that also has this inaudible sound. God knows all things. God knows that sound. God knows that sound if it's sinful, if it's imperfect, if it's not according to knowledge, if it's a correct groaning and sorrow and anguish. God knows, God deciphers it, and God acts. God hears with sympathy. Here I'm thinking about John 11, the raising of, of Lazarus, where the scripture says in verse 33, Jesus gets there. Jesus therefore saw her weeping, Mary, and the Jews also weeping with which came with her, and he groaned in spirit, and he was troubled. 
the act of the raising of Lazarus, the sound here that the Son of God, the Son of Man hears when he comes and Lazarus has died, this beloved brother, friend, believer, this voice of weeping. Every one of us, I'm sure, has heard the voice of, of weeping. Mm. Humanly, we know what it sounds like. Does, does, how does God hear that in heaven? Mm. Remember, heaven, there's nothing negative there. No death, no sorrow, no pain. But, but God hears the sound of weeping. Here, Jesus, fully God, fully man, comes back, and he groans in his spirit, and he's troubled at the death of Lazarus. He's concerned. He hears the weeping. You might say, why does Jesus care? Everybody's going to die. Death is the wages that man earned when he fell in the garden. And Lazarus was a believer. So he, he entered the portals of heaven. And, and Jesus himself was very soon going to encounter death himself a very specific, unique death where he would incur the wrath of his father, paying the equivalent of an eternity in hell for all of our sins. But the scripture here in John 11 clearly shows he, he had a genuine, fully realized compassion and sympathy. He was expressing sympathy as he heard their sorrow, their weeping. He, he had bowels of mercy which the child of God needs, which they needed then. He groaned within his spirit and he was troubled. Have you ever been in a public place, some sad news comes to you, or there's some reason that you just want to, to burst out and cry, but, but you, you have to hold it in. You try to check it. I don't want to be seen crying in front of these people or in this case. You know, maybe my cat died. Well, I don't want them to think I'm that bound up in the life of this cat. I can't cry. The, the Greek words here are like Jesus almost, who was always dignified, he, he was always perfect, but it's almost as though he's, he's checking his emotions, he's ready to cross that line. That's how affected he was with their weeping. He heard, he just didn't hear the, he just didn't hear the audible sound of crying. He heard supernaturally. He heard divinely. He heard the misery. He heard everything attached with that weeping. He was troubled. It's a very significant phrase. You know, in all points, he was made like unto his brethren. He had perfect command of all of his emotions. He was always dignified. If he expressed anger when he cast out the, the, the money changers from the temple, if he wept, he, he, a few verses later, he weeps with those who weep at Lazarus' tomb, does he not? He keeps our tears in a bottle, paraphrasing what, what Job talked about. He remembers that. He hears those things. Well, that's just a very brief survey, a brief overview. Hearing implies closeness. Lori is finding out that no longer can I be two or three rooms away when she says something to me because I won't hear her. I won't even be able to say what? It goes silent because I didn't hear her. I have to be a lot closer. God is very close to us. He, he hears and everything has a voice. Sin has a voice. Things that we think are inaudible, inanimate, a lifestyle, a, an instant. God hears. Everything, and everything has a voice. He hears blood crying from the ground. He hears the voice of wickedness. He hears the voice of idolatry. He hears the voice of murmuring and complaining, the voice of doubt, the voice of dejection, the voice of sadness. Many other things he hears. He hears creation groaning. He hears uh, in, in 2 Kings 19, it says he hears something that's going to be said in the future as though it's in the past and he's going to act. Mm. 
So, so that's what I wanted to share today before we get into a few applications. This idea of the omniscience of God, that he knows all things, it's a very personal doctrine because this one idea, we could have looked at how, what he sees, but he hears all these things. He's close. Let me leave you with a few applications that I'll try to just mention. Number one, the fact that God hears everything and he's omniscient should be one of those things that helps us to pursue holiness. We've been hearing a lot from Pastor Joe about pursuing holiness, making a conscious effort. And, and we have to remember, God is close. And God tells us you know, to flee from sin and temptation and all of the negative things and run to him. And we have to remember, if we're ever in that, that in-between place, that God is there and he's hearing those thoughts, those motions, those actions. And in, in, a, in a positive way, we know that holiness, personal holiness, is something that he wants in our life. So we can ask for grace to help to get over there on that side of the line. Secondly, God's omniscience serves as a basis for trusting in him, his guidance. He, he, he knows all things, so he never makes a mistake. Nothing ever, you know, passes by him. He, he doesn't make a mistake due to, to a lack of foresight. He can't overlook, nothing catches him by surprise. We should be able to trust and have faith in him. Thirdly, God's omniscience speaks to us about the reality of the love of God for us. There's not a single skeleton in your closet that God doesn't know about. He's already aware of that. He's aware of a future fall that you might have, and that will not affect his love for you. He knows you entirely and thoroughly. A quote from A.W. Pink. The apprehension of God's infinite omniscience should fill the Christian with adoration because the whole of my life stood open to his view from the beginning of time. He foresaw my every fall, my every sin, my every backsliding, yet, nevertheless, he fixed his heart upon me. God's omniscient should open to us the, the love of God, which is a personal mm. reality aspect of our relationship with him. Number four, God's omniscient, omniscience should serve a, a comfort for us because a lot of times people don't understand us or they mistake something that we say. It's like hearing a sound you know, you hear a, a car horn, and someone said, why did that train blow its whistle? Totally missed something. God knows our hearts. He knows what we mean. He knows our motivations. He knows where we really are trying to go. And we'll be in situations where we're, we are misunderstood. People will judge us falsely. That will happen until we die. But God knows, because he knows all things. And he's close at hand. Fifthly and lastly, as I mentioned, there's a lot of noise and voices attached with a lot of negative things that God is hearing constantly. Why don't we drown out that sound of sin and lukewarmness and sin and indifference? We should drown that sound out with praise, with worship. I, want, I don't want God to hear the voice of shed blood, which can occur in my heart. If I, if I say, thou fool, if I hate somebody in my heart, I've committed murder, Jesus said, right? I want to drown out and tamp down any of those ugly sounds with the sound of worship and praise and adoration. So if there's this balance, God hears more of that from my life than he does from the other. Well, may God be pleased to 
just begin to, to get us to think about some of these things that we might glorify him as we go about our day-to-day -day life, which to many people, as they would look at us as believers, would say it's very mundane, very boring. We have a vital relationship with the God of heaven, and he's working in our life every minute of every day. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, our Father, that um, though just a very brief survey, this whole idea, Lord, we know that you know all things. Like Peter said, Lord, you know all things. Lord, might we live with that reality every day, understanding and aware of it, that we would put a guard on our lips, on that, that bridle, that rudder, as James spoke about, a bridle on our thoughts, and Lord, that we might be filled with those sounds of praise and worship and blessing. Lord, help us to be the people of God. Help us to, to live as shining lights, glorifying you in the midst of this, this perverse, this evil, this wicked world that is making so much sound that is so, so awful, we know in your sight. Thank you for the fellowship of the saints. Thank you for the worship today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.